当你出生在一个地方，你不会注意到身边关于他的任何事，直到你离开。如果你不再回来，你只能通过记忆去回忆那些事情，而这些记忆很容易被扭曲。但如果你回来了，你会因为思念家乡而仔细的观察它，这也是一种扭曲。我不确定哪种会更好。我在很小的时候就离开了后头湾，之后再也没有回来过。我记忆里最多的，便是大海的声音，以及任何事情发生所花费的漫长的时间，任何事。
舟山西北部有一小列岛屿，称为圣寺。多年前，这里是海盗和渔民的好去处，但现在只剩渔民了。这里的大部分岛屿都只是从水中升起的小山丘，顶部呈圆形，就像所有的点、角和棱面都被打磨过一样。风总是有足够的时间去做这样的事。这里的绝大多数岛屿都不是很漂亮，只有红色和灰色的岩石。小的时候，我总觉得钱塘江像妈妈一样，把这些岛屿都推出海边，这样它们就会长得又大又漂亮。但那只是孩童般的想法罢了。他们只是一些有人居住的岩石而已，但这些岛屿的某些地方很难不被称之为浪漫的场所。他们骄傲而暴躁，我们看到他们似乎已经战胜了风浪，当然他们没有，也不会。但是在几十万年的时间里，他们似乎也可以做到。圣斯列岛并不在世界的边缘，他们可能有时在图片上看起来是这样的，但事实并非如此。他们距离上海只有不到一百五十公里，只是大海会让一切都慢下来。所以你从小就听说你的朋友和亲戚在北方和大陆冒险，有时你甚至会和家人一起去那里旅行。很自然的，你会听到既不是渔民，也不是旅馆服务员的故事，并对此感到好奇。我不曾记得做出过离开村庄和岛屿的决定，但我确实记得我的好奇心逐渐变成了梦想，变成了计划，变成了与父母的交谈。离开小岛，过上更好的生活，并不是完全闻所未闻。很多人都这样做了。但是无论如何，我的父母都不愿意鼓励我谈话不断的进行，而我仍然充满希望。没有电影里那样戏剧化，我们并没有在餐桌上举行大型的家庭会议，只是一些探讨关于在大陆生活的可能性，以及远离父母。有时我妈妈会在照料她的花园时问我，如果我没有钱了怎么办？或者我爸爸。会在打理鱼的时候，温柔地告诉我，这不是人们在大陆时吃晚饭会做的事情。这种交流是零散的，但仍在继续。这给了我一丝希望。也许在他们那些不动的眼睛后面，有什么东西在变化。他们美丽的、饱经风霜的面孔，有可能隐藏着某些变化。而他们的思想比他们的身体转变得更快。
随着年龄的增长，这些简短的对话不断的出现，但很明显，什么都没有发生，没有明确的支持。但也没有明确的反对。也许他们是用这种方式来告诉我，我必须主动带着计划与他们交谈。也许他们希望我放弃这个想法，继续和他们一起生活，并照顾他们。我不确定他们是否意识到，如果我留在岛上，我就赚不到那么多的钱，这肯定会影响到他们以后的生活质量。但如果他们想让我好好照顾他们，甚至更早的帮助到他们，我唯一的选择就是去大陆。不过，如果我留在岛上，我当然也会有个未来。但这不是任何人想要的未来我从来没有得到他们的支持和祝福，但这并不重要。没有什么戏剧性的故事。毕业后，我联系了几个已经离开的朋友，并且我们计划了所有事。所以，当我离开这个岛时，就像是去朋友家一样。我说了再见，他们问了我什么时候会回来，之后我便乘车去码头离开了。陪伴我的只有一个背包。当然。做任何事都有风险，但直到过去的几个晚上，在所有的兴奋都消退之后，我才意识到这次贸然离开的风险。如果我没有赚到足够的钱寄回家怎么办？如果我没有发展一个好的事业，也没有帮助我的父母过上更好的退休生活，怎么办？我冷静下来，告诉自己，无论如何，我在大陆赚的钱，都会比在后头湾赚的多。到最后，如果我真的失败了，我也会比我的父母更早知道，并且会有足够的时间回家。但命运注定我不会失败，我也不会回后头湾。
Chinese Repository, Volume 9, from May 1840 to December 1840. This island is about 30 miles in length and 15 in breadth, and is surrounded by hundreds of others, varying in size from little islets or mere broken This island is about 30 miles in length and 15 in breadth and is surrounded by hundreds of others, varying in size from little islets or mere barren rocks just rising above the water to islands several miles in circumference. An eyewitness thus describes them. Most of the Chusun Islands consisted of hills rising with regular slope and rounded at top as if any points or angles existing in their original formation had been gradually worn off into globular and uniform shape. Many of these islands, though close to each other, were divided by channels of great depth. They rested upon a foundation of grey or red granite, some part resembling porphyry except in hardness. They were certainly not formed in consequence of successive alluvion by earth carried to the sea by the great river at whose mouth they were situated, like the numerous low and muddy islands at the mouth of the Po and many others, but should rather be considered as the remains but should rather be considered but should rather be considered as the remains of the part of the continent thus scooped and furrowed as it were into islands by the force of violent torrents wafting farther into the sea whatever was less resistible than the lock Whatever was less resistible than the lock whatever was the less resistible than the rocks just mentioned, some of them wore a very inviting aspect. Official notice to His Britannic Majesty's subject in China. Official notice to His Britannic Majesty's subjects in China. Dispatches have been received from the Right Honourable the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, signifying the abolition of the office and salary of the Chief Superintendent of the Trade of British Subjects in China. His Majesty's Government has been pleased to appoint Captain Charles Elliot, Royal Navy to perform the duties of Chief of the Commission from this date, by order of the Superintendents of the Trade of British Subjects in China. Signed, Edward Elmsley, Secretary and Treasurer, Macau, December 14, 1836. Number 90. Captain Elliot to Viscount Palmerston. Received July 1837. My Lord Macau, February 2nd, 1837. I have now the honour to transmit to your Lordship as remarkable a series of papers as has ever been as ever series of papers as has ever yet emanated from the government of this country 
I have now the honour to transmit to your Lordship as remarkable a series of papers as has ever yet emanated from the government of this country in respect to the foreign trade. Vague reports had received the factory. Se Vague reports had reached the factory several months before, to the effect that the court was seriously contemplating the legalization of the opium trade. Little credit, however, was attached to these rumors. But I confess I was one amongst the very few persons who thought they were well founded. And notwithstanding or the actual degree of rigorous prohibition, I am still of the opinion that the legal admission of opium may be looked for. The first paper I ever saw which led me to reason that such a measure had been entertained at Pekin is a striking memorial from the great governor and lieutenant governor of these provinces to the emperor. It is without date, but it came into the possession of the foreigners so remotely as the year 1832. In this document, there is a forecast of the scheme of legalization, and it... and it is difficult to believe that the high officers of such a government as this would have ventured to shadow it forth, even in far more obscure terms than these, if they had not been sensible that these if they had not been sensible that there was already a powerful party in play, already a powerful party in favour of the measure. This hint drew upon This hint, drew, this hint drew down upon their excellencies. Indeed, the formal censor of, the, of his majesty. This hint drew down upon their excellencies. Indeed, the formal censor of his, his imperial majesty. But still the idea will present itself that the policy must have had its influential advocates, even at this date. Even at that distant date. We, your ministers, say the memorialists, after humble consideration, are of opinion that opium having become prevalent in the country, vagabonds who smoke it to the inquiry of their lives, vagabonds who smoke it to the injury of their lives and of their constitutions, do so entirely from their own stupidity and refusal to be aroused, and are therefore unworthy of regret. But the loss of wealth and waste of treasure are exceedingly great, and the evil suffered is not indeed light. If at this time it were suffered to be brought in and publicly used with legal permission as a medicine, this would prevent the foreigners from raising the price to an enormous height. Thus also might a silent impediment be placed in the way of their adversaries' plans and large profits. Thus also might a silent impediment be placed in the way of their adversaries' plants and large profits. Thus also might a silent impediment be placed in the way of their avaricious plants and large profits. Still, then, would this not be a sudden acquiescence in and given unlimited license to the evil? But this reflection, on the contrary, is the preface to a strong and faithful picture of the mischief and the hopelessness of all proceedings of that kind. There is little reason to conclude that the recommendation of such a policy as this would ever have been allowed to be published, still less that the policy itself would be worked out. 
if there were no more urgent incentives to its adoption than But this reflection, on the contrary, is the preface to a strong and faithful picture of the mischief and the hopelessness of all proceedings of that kind. There is little reason to conclude that the recommendation of such a policy as this would have ever have been allowed to be published, still less that the policy itself would be worked out. 
if there was no more urgent incentives to its adoption than are to be found in the awakening spirit of a public virtue upon the part of the Chinese government. The opium trade only commenced, or subsisted, as its present state of stagnation indisputably proves, by reason of the hearty concurrence of the chief authorities of these provinces, and, indeed, also of the court. No portion of the trade to this country more regularly paid its entrance than this of the opium, from a traffic prohibited in point of form but essentially countenanced and carried out entirely by natives in native boats. It will come to be a complete smuggling trade. The opium will be conveyed to parts of the coast previously concerted in Canton in British boats and thence be run by the natives thus throwing our people into immediate contact with the inhabitants on shore and certainly, in other respects, vastly enhancing the chances of serious disputes and collisions with the government officers. It seems to be probable that this state of things would either hasten forward the legalization edict It seems to be probable that this state of things would either hasten forward the legalization edict or, in the event of any check to our boats, defer it to some indefinite period, and in other ways, very inconveniently alter the whole position of circumstances in this country. Your Lordship, I hope, will consider I am justified in respectfully moving these authorities to do what can be done safely and without inconveniently committing his majesty's government towards the relief of the most important branch of this trade with the languor of which the whole british commerce to the empire necessarily sympathizes in a very serious degree the imports of opium last year on the account of our merchants amounted to nearly eighteen million of dollars being about one million in excess of the whole value of teas and silk exported during the same period on British account. Your Lordship will judge how unfortunately the interruption of this traffic must operate on the general commerce. Signed, Charles Elliot, Chief Superintendent. Enclosure 7, in number 90, Imperial Edict in reply to the preceding documents. The Councillor Chu Sun has presented a memorial requesting that the severity of the prohibitory enactments against opium may be increased. The sub-censor Hugh Q also has laid before us a respectful representation of his views and, in a supplementary statement, a recommendation to punish severely Chinese traitors. Opium, coming from the distant regions of barbarians, has pervaded this country with its baneful influence and has been made a subject of very severe prohibitory enactments. But, of late, there has been a diversity of opinion in regard to it, some requesting a change in the policy hitherto adopted and others recommending the continuance of the severe prohibition and others recommending the continuance of the severe and others recommending the continuance of the severe prohibitions. It is highly important to consider the subject carefully in all its bearings, surveying at once the whole field of action, so that such measures may be adopted as shall continue forever in force, free from all failure. Strict investigation let Han. Strict investigation let Tang and his colleagues anxiously and carefully consult together upon to be made. The recommendation to the recommendation to search for and with utmost strictness apprehend all those traitorous natives who sell the drug, the Hong merchants who arrange the transactions in it, the brokers who purchase it by wholesale, the boatmen who are engaged in transporting it, and the naval militia who receive bribes, and having determined on the steps to be taken in order to stop up the sources of evil.
and the naval militia who receive bribes and having determined on the steps to be taken in order to stop the source of the evil let them present a true and faithful report let them also carefully ascertain and report whether the circumstances stated by QQ in his supplementary document in reference to the foreigners who beyond the seas be true or not whether such things as are mentioned therein have or have not taken place copies of the several documents are to be herewith sent to those officers for perusal and his edict to be made known to Tang and Kurt who are enjoying copies of the several documents are to be herewith sent to those officers for perusal and this edict to be made known to Tang and Kerr, who are to enjoy in it also on Wan, the superintendent of maritime customs. Respect this. Number 110, Captain Elliot to Viscount Palmerston, received May 15, 1838. My Lord Canton, November 19, 1837. I now beg leave to resume the subject of my dispatch of the 2nd February this year. In the early part of this year, the project of immediately legalizing the traffic of opium was, without doubt, favorably entertained at the court. And, situated as we are, it is impossible to detect the particular management by which the postponement of the measure may have been achieved. We have now arrived, however, at a, at a we have now arrived, however, at a stage in the passage of circumstances when it appears to be necessary that the subject should once more be drawn upon your lordship's serious attention that the subject should once more be drawn under your Lordship's serious attention. The vigorous proceedings of the provincial government against the native smugglers at the outed... The vigorous proceedings of the provincial government against the native smugglers at the outside anchorages in the immediate neighbourhood of this port have had the effect of vastly increasing the traffic on the eastern coasts of this and the neighbouring provinces of Fukin. Still within the last few months, that branch of the trade never afforded employment to more than two or three small vessels. But at the date of this dispatch, and for some months past, there have not been less than 20 sail of vessels on the east coast. I am sorry to add that there is every reason to believe blood has been spilt in the interchange of shot which has ever and anon taken place between them and the Mandarin boats. The most grave result of the vigilance upon the spot remains to be decried. The most grave result of the vigilance upon the spot remains to be decried. The native boats have been burned and the native smugglers scattered. And the consequence is 
as it was foreseen to be, and the consequence is, as it was foreseen it would be, that a complete and very hazardous change has been worked in by the The most grave result of the vigilance upon the spot remains to be decried. The most grave result of the vigilance upon the spot remains to be described. The native boats have been burned and the native smugglers scattered. And the consequence is, as it was foreseen it would be, that a complete and very hazardous change has been worked in that a very that a complete and very hazardous change has been worked in the whole manner of conducting the Canton portion of the trade. The opium is now carried on, and a great part of it inwards to Wampoa, in European passage boats belonging to British owners, slenderly mannered by Lanskar seamen, and furnished with a scanty armament, which may rather be said to which may rather be said to provoke or to justify search, accompanied by violence than to furnish the means of an effectual defence. I have no certain means of judging to what extent the shipping of Wampoa may be implicated in this new mode of carrying on this trade, but I am not without reason to believe that they are so, and possibly in an increasing degree. And as your lordship is probably aware that the Hong merchant who secures each ship and the captain and consignee join in a bond that she has no opium on board, it is needless to dwell upon the very embarrassing consequence which would ensue if the existence of a different state of facts should nevertheless be established. I am disposed to believe that the higher officers of the provincial government are perfectly sensible of the extensive smuggling of opium carried on in the European passage boats, and from some motive, either of interest or policy, or probably both, they oppose no immediate obstacle to such a condition of things, but the continuance of their inertness is not to be dependent on. Signed, Charles Elliot, Chief Superintendent. Captain Elliot to Viscount Palmerston, received March 27. 1840. Her Majesty's ship, Volage. My Lord, Tonku, November 16, 1839. If my private feelings were of the least consequence upon questions of a public and important nature, assuredly I might justly say that no man entertains a deeper detestation of the disgrace and sin of this forced traffic on the coast of China than the humble individual who signs the dispatch. I see little to choose between it and piracy, and in my place, as a public officer, I have steadily discountenanced it by all the lawful means in my power, and at the total sacrifice of my private comfort in the society in which I have lived for some years past. But, whilst I have endeavoured to fulfil my duty to Her Majesty's government in the public course of repression I have pursued, it did not consist with my station to sanction measures of general and undistinguishing violence against Her Majesty's officers and subjects, and to a mode of working out objects, right or wrong, which set all the obligations of moderation and justice at defiance. I have, etc., signed Charles Elliot, Chief Superintendent.
a statistical sketch of the island of Chusan with a brief note on the geology of China by Lieutenant Okdoloni, FGS of the Madras Engineers, London, 1841. The following brief notes were originally printed in Madras by the author for private circulation in India, but the interest in the public mind to all connected the expedition to China has induced their republication here and, under the supposition that it might be deemed an interesting prefix to the work, the London publisher has extracted from authentic sources a summary narrative of the proceedings connected with the voyages towards Chusan and the occupation of the island by Her Majesty's forces. London, March 29, 1841. It was on the 30th of May, 1840, that the fleet present at Singapore and destined for the British operations in the seas and on the coast of China sailed from those roads. The whole cleared Sarah Island and entered the harbour of Chusan, where the Wellesley was found anchored within two or three hundred yards of the shore, her broadside bearing on the town and a signal for the troops to get into the boats and prepare to land immediately, flying at her masthead. The Conway was anchored opposite a rather high hill on which two or three guns were observed in front of a joss house. The alligator and the cruiser astern to her and the Algerine astern of the Wellesley, opposite a war junk and a round tower upon which some guns were mounted. Two companies of the 18th Royal Irish with a hundred marines were directed to land in the first boats with the Rattlesnake and the Wellesley. In the meantime, overtures had been made through Mr. Guslaff the interpreter to the force, to the admiral of the station, regarding the occupation of the island, and proclamations in Chinese of the following purport were sent to him and to the authorities on shore. If the inhabitants of the said islands do not oppose and resist our forces, it is not the intention of the British government to do the injury to their persons and property. There were many tons of shot, all of cast iron very clumsily found, as were also the iron guns, but they had been no doubt cast in this country, as Chinese characters were raised upon them evidently stamped in the mould, and it remained a curious point to be ascertained whether the art of casting in iron, which is said to have been introduced in China by the Jesuits, has made any progress or is still preserved in the country. Some edicts signed by the principal Mandarin were found in the lower or sea town, ordering the people to resist the barbarian foreigners to the utmost, and assigning certain streets and districts to the charge of individuals named. But no papers were seen whose contents shewed that the attack upon the island was at all expected by the Chinese government. On examination, the town was found almost utterly abandoned, save by a few trembling wretches seeking to carry out their property and by parties of low vagabonds who were prowling about to thieve what they could lay hold of. Measures were therefore immediately taken to prevent pillage by the troops and camp followers, and sentries and guards were posted at all the gates. The bridges, every one of which had been broken down by the Chinese, were repaired without delay, and proclamations written in the native character by Mr. Gutslav were pasted against the walls in all the most public parts of the town. The Honourable George Eliot C.B. arrived at Chusan in Her Majesty's ship, Melville.
The Taking of Hong Kong, Susanna Ho and Derek Roebuck, 1999. On 6th July, the island of Chusan to the south of Shanghai and the mouth of the Yangtzeang River. On 6th July, the island of Chusan to the south of Shanghai and the mouth of the Yangtzeang and its city of Dinghai were taken within a few hours and occupied by British forces. Some attempt was made to take the island without force, but after a conference on board the Wellesley, a Chinese deputation insisted that duty and honour called for them to resist. They were given some hours to change their minds, but when the naval bombardment, followed by a military assault, went ahead. They were given some hours to change their minds, but then the naval bombardment, followed by a military assault, went ahead. The taking of Chusan, 800 miles north of Macau, answered three British needs. It provided a base from which to move further up the coast, a possible permanent centre for trade, and a threat via the canals that linked the great commercial waterways and the granaries of central China to the north to the court of Peking. That threat was intended to encourage the Chinese government to negotiate whether or not Chusan should be part of the long-term British strategy as a territorial acquisition was to become increasingly a bone of contention. Whether or not Chusan should be part of a long-term British strategy as a territorial acquisition whether or not Chusan should be part of a long-term British strategy as a territorial acquisition was to become increasingly a bone of contention. There was a supposition built into policy and thus into instructions that the Han Chinese of the east coast of China, including those of Chusan, would welcome the arrival of the British as a release from tyrannical Manchu rulers. Although this was only one consideration, it was not born out of... Bo although this was only one consideration, it was not borne out by events. The issue of Chusan was only to be resolved by the Treaty of Nanking of 1842, and what he was in charge, Charles Elliot, was to be squeezed, crushed even, between opposing and shifting positions. Narrative of the Second Campaign in China Keith Stuart Mackenzie, London, 1842 Having secured our prisoners, the troops laid down to rest and had the satisfaction of witnessing the nemesis. A boat of the men of war attacked the war junks in Anson's Bay. The first shot went completely through a large junk and sent the crew jumping into the water in all directions, while a Congreve rocket, which was fired at the Admiral's junk, went through the deck into the magazine, upon which she immediately blew up. Being full both of men and money, which had been sent down from Canton to pay the troops, the loss was great. These operations continued for some hours, during which time 17 junks were destroyed and many brought away. For a return of the ordnance captured in these forts and junks, see Appendix A. On returning with Sir Gordon Bremner to the Wellesley, we found a Chinese medico on board, who had been taken prisoner at Tai Kok To. As Captain Elliot supposed that the Chinese, after their lesson of the forenoon, might be more pacifically inclined, he dispatched a chop by this prisoner to Quan, the Chinese admiral, explaining different usages of civilised war, adding that if the fort struck their colours, we would not fire on them, but would take them under our protection. 
there can be no doubt that Captain Elliot, in sending this chop, was actuated by feelings of pure humanity for having witnessed the great loss of life sustained by the Chinese in the morning, together with the probability of a still greater loss in the capture of the large forts he wished, if possible, to spare them. The policy of the act may, however, be questioned, more particularly by His Excellency's knowledge of the national character. Subsequent events have also shown how utterly unworthy they were of such leniency, and with what a perfidious race we had to contend. Calcutta, February 9, 1841. No more decisive news from China. Charles Eliot still goes on negotiating, or, as the people there call it, negotiating. The navy, army, and merchants are all equally dissatisfied. By the last letter, he declared Sir Gordon Bremner was to attack the Bogue forts the next day if the Chinese did not sign the treaty. He has said so often that nobody will believe it till they see it. And even when they do it, it is impossible not to regret that it is not done a year ago. Mrs. Elliot has rather a hard time of it, I fancy, as the society here is chiefly mercantile, and they all consider themselves ruined by this weakness and procrastination, and the papers too are all full of abuse. She bears it better than most people would, but fidgets about his vacillation, I suspect. She talks of sailing in about 10 days. This day, 12 months, how seasick I hope to be. Yours most affably, E.E. E. personal aside. History is a funny thing to approach with a movie camera. Before the movie's images were free, they simply occurred in imagination 
or in the conjurings of painters, poets, or photo alchemists. They were arranged in whatever order they were happened upon, and by whatever obscure processes they entered into the imagination. But for images to move, to really move before our eyes, freedoms had to be sacrificed. Images must occur in a certain order to be able to move. As a result, those sequences of moving images must also be placed in a certain order so that the previous and successive sequences are contextualized to achieve greater meaning. History is a bit like that. Most everything in history can be explained well by what came before and after whatever it is you're thinking of. But more than that, history is alive by nature of its perpetual continuation. History is a picture, but it's never finished and no one can see it. No one can see all of it anyway. It's more or less the idea of a picture. And with new discoveries, scholarship, and research, the idea of this image changes, sometimes gradually, sometimes very suddenly. But it remains mostly invisible. History movie is almost a contradiction of terms. To make a movie about history is to sacrifice history in the name of what is visible, or sacrifice what is visible in the name of history. But what can come of balancing these sacrifices?
talk to you about our trip. Right now? Yeah. I thought you were working. Mm, not anymore. You told me you were working. Well, let's talk about the trip now. If you have time, sure, let's do it. Okay. So what plan do you have? I thought you were asking me because you have a plan. Yeah, I want to go Shanghai. Again? Yes. No, I don't want to go to Shanghai. Why? Why do you have to go to Shanghai now? We have so many days off. Because it's closed? Yes, exactly right. So we can go to a place that's far away. We don't have that many days. And five days. Not enough. It is enough. Spend the weekend in another country. No way. Shanghai is not even two hours away by train. Yeah, it's one hour away, so what? You can go there any weekend. Not really. Any weekend. Not really. Yes, you can go there. Two hours, take a train, get to Shanghai Hongqiao on a Friday, come back on Sunday. But I will be tired. That's normal. It's my holiday, I don't want to get tired. That's not a problem. I have the five days holiday, and then I want, only want to spend three days outside. Too little.
said we can go there any other weekend. It's not a particular weekend, it's a holiday. Well, exactly right, it's a holiday. You can go literally farther away. But I need to rest. No, only weak people need to rest. I am a weak people. Then you rest. I travel. Okay. You said okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you're gonna travel by yourself. What? So you're gonna travel by yourself. Five days. Yeah. Where are you gonna go? And five nights. Okay, where are you gonna go? No, actually four nights. Yeah. Four nights, five days. Where are you gonna go? Uh, I think I'm gonna go to... Captain Elliot's circular to Her Britannic Majesty's subjects, Macau, 20th of January, 1841. Her Majesty's plenipotentiary has now to announce the conclusion of preliminary arrangements between the Imperial Commissioner and himself, involving the following conditions. 1. The cession of the island and harbour of Hong Kong to the British Crown. All just charges and duties to the Empire upon the commerce carried on there to be paid as if the trade were conducted at Wampoa. 2. An indemnity to the British government of six millions of dollars, one million payable at once, and the remainder in equal annual instalments ending in 1846. 3. Direct official intercourse between the countries upon an equal footing. 4 the trade of the port of Canton to be opened within 10 days after the Chinese New Year and to be carried on at Wampoa till further arrangements are practicable at the new settlement. Details remain matter of negotiation. The plenipotentiary seizes the earliest occasion to declare that Her Majesty's government has sought for no privilege in China exclusively for the advantage of British ships and merchants, and he is only performing his duty in offering the protection of the British flag to the subjects, citizens and ships of foreign power that may resort to Her Majesty's possession. Pending Her Majesty's further pleasure, there will be no port or other changes to the British government. The plenipotentiary now permits himself to make a few general observations. The oblivion of past and redressed injuries will follow naturally from the right feeling of the Queen's subjects. Indeed, it should be remembered that no extent of modification resulting only from political intervention can be efficacious in the steady improvement of our condition unless it be systematically seconded by conciliatory treatment of the people and becoming deference for the institutions and governments of the country, upon the threshold of which we are about to be established. The plenipotentiary can only presume to advert very briefly to the zeal and wisdom of the commander of the expedition to China, and to that rare union of ardour, patience and forbearance which we distinguished the officers and forces of all arms at all points of occupation and operation. He is well assured the British community will sympathise cordially with him in their sentiments of lasting respect for His Excellency and the whole force, which he is ashamed to express in such inadequate language. He cannot conclude without declaring that next to these causes, the peaceful adjustment of difficulties must be ascribed to the scrupulous good faith of the very eminent person with whom negotiations are still pending. Signed, Charles Elliot. 
Her Majesty's Plenipotentiary, China. Viscount Palmerston to Queen Victoria, China, Foreign Office, 10th of April, 1841. Viscount Palmerston presents his humbly duty. Viscount Palmerston presents his humble duty to the. Ma Viscount Palmerston presents his humble duty to Your Majesty, and has the honour to submit the accompanying letters, which he received yesterday, about the operations in China, and which have be just been returned to him by Viscount. Viscount Palmerston presents Viscount Palmerston presents his humble duty to your majesty and has the honor to submit the accompanying letters which he received yesterday about the operations in China and which have just been returned to him by Val about the operations in China and which have just been returned to him by Viscount Viscount Palmerston presents his humble duty to your majesty and has the honor to submit the accompanying letters which he received yesterday about the operations in China and which have just been returned to him by Viscount Melbourne, whose letters he also transmits. Viscount Palmerston has felt greatly mortified and disappointed at this result of the expedition to China, and he much fears that the sequel of the negotiation, which was to follow the conclusion of these preliminary conditions, will not tend to render the arrangement less objectionable. Captain Elliot seems to have wholly disregarded the instruction which have been sent to him, and even when, by the entire success of the operation of the fleet, he was in a condition to dictate his own terms, he seems to have agreed to very inadequate conditions. The amount of compensation for the opium surrendered falls short of the value of that opium, and nothing has been obtained for the expenses of the expedition, nor for the debts of the bankrupt Hong merchants. The securities which the plenipotentiaries were expressly ordered to obtain for British residents in China have been abandoned, and the island of Chusan, which they were specifically informed, has to be retained till the whole of the pecuniary compensation should have been paid, has been hastily and discreditably evacuated. Even the cession of Hong Kong has been coupled with a condition about the payment of duties, which would render that island not a possession of the British crown, but, like Macau, a settlement held by sufferance in the territory of the crown of China. 
Viscount Palmerston has sent a small map of the Canton River, which your majesty may like to keep for future reference. Official notice to His Britannic Majesty's subjects in China. Dispatches have been received from the Right Honourable the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, signifying the recall of Captain Charles Elliot, Royal Navy. His Majesty's Government has been pleased to appoint Sir Henry Pottinger, First Baronet, to perform the duties of Chief of the Commission from this date, by order of the Superintendents of the Trade of British Subjects in China, May. 1841. Viscount Palmerston's instructions to Sir H. Pottinger respecting opium on his departure for China, 31st of May, 1841. It is of great importance, with a view to the maintenance of permanent good understanding between two countries, that the Chinese government should place the opium trade upon some regular and legalized footing. Experience has shown that it is entirely beyond the power of the Chinese government to prevent the introduction of opium into China, and many reasons render it impossible that the British government can give the Chinese government any effectual aid towards the accomplishment of that purpose. But while the opium trade is forbidden by law, it must inevitably be carried out by fraud and violence, and hence must arise frequent conflicts and collisions between the Chinese preventative service and the parties who are engaged in carrying on the opium trade. These parties are generally British subjects, and it is impossible to suppose that this private war can be carried on between British opium smugglers and the Chinese authorities, without events happening which must tend to put in jeopardy the good understanding between the Chinese and British governments. Her Majesty's government makes no demand in this matter, for they have no right to do so. The Chinese government is fully entitled to prohibit the importation of opium if it pleases, and British subjects who engage in contraband trade must take the consequences of doing so.
but it is desirable that you should avail yourself of every favorable opportunity to strongly impress upon the Chinese plenipotentiary and through him upon the Chinese government how much it would be for the interest of the Chinese government itself to alter the law of China on this matter and to legalize by a regular duty a trade which they cannot prevent. Appendix A. Appendix B, the ten sighs, performed in the style of Gushu, which is popular in Beijing, Hebei, and Tianjin. This piece tells the story of an opium-addicted person, unidentified performers, circa 1901-1902, China, Beijing, unidentified location. Thank you. 
Appendix C, the female opium smokers at 3 a.m. in the morning, sung by a male performer, performed in a Danxiang narrative genre called Wu Gong, Five Night Times, unidentified performers, circa 1901-1902, China, Beijing, unidentified location.
比我预计的时间要长，但我的朋友帮我找到了工作。讽刺的是，是在酒店也。不过赚的钱比我在家里的旅馆赚的多得多。因为我做的很好，所以我被调到一家知名度更高的酒店，并为入住的重要客人提供一些专门的服务。我开始寄钱回家。并且我的父母也开始定期给我打电话。从这些谈话中，我了解到，他们已经从后头湾搬到了岛上更发达的地方。我也许有些难过，但并不感到惊讶。那里的许多人都搬出去了。我想，这对于我的父母来说，搬走也只是时间问题。毕竟他们年纪都大了。从这些谈话中，我感受到，他们终于接受了我搬到大陆的决定。我猜他们应该也很开心，我能寄那些钱故事到这里就结束了，因为我无法讲述还未发生的事。但是，当我听到或者看到人们在讨论后头湾时，会觉得很有趣。最近在网上出现了该村庄的一些照片，游客们来到这个岛屿参观时，就像在参观一个古老的历史遗迹，而事实上。它仅在大约五十年内建成并被废弃，比大多数人的一生都要短。对比一只巨型海龟的生命，则更短。它不古老，甚至都没有很破旧，只是那里不容易建渔村，所以我们在别处建了一个。不过这很有趣，当你出生在一个地方。你不会注意到身边关于他的任何事，直到你离开。虽然我早就离开了，也从来没有回来过，但我的记忆不是我曾经住过的后头湾，而是现在的样子，被遗弃，覆盖着藤蔓，其脆弱的结构会随着时间慢慢的屈服。很多年过去了，我已经不记得有多少年
，我听到了一位老朋友的消息。他曾经住在我们家附近，并且现在还住在岛上。我非常想念他，也很高兴能了解到他现在的生活。他说